بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I showed in the previous episode that the stunning variety in the universe is evidence that God is not just a necessary being, but a necessary being who is also a volitional agent, meaning someone who freely chose to make each thing in the universe the way that it is. A volitional agent, remember, is someone who is alive and someone who has knowledge, will, and power. The opposite of a volitional agent is a non-living cause, like fire. A volitional agent creates both an effect and its opposite. God makes night and day, rain and shine, wind and still, and so on, but it is impossible for a non-living cause to bring about both an effect and its opposite. Fire always makes water boil. It never freezes it. If this sounds unfamiliar, you should pause me right here and listen to the previous episode before continuing further. At the end of the previous episode, I also showed that the stunning variety in the universe is not only evidence for God's volitional agency that he knows, chooses, and creates, but that it is evidence for his unrestricted volitional agency, that he knows everything, that he can choose anything and that he can create anything. I will show in this episode that modern scientific discoveries about the universe reveal God's unrestricted agency even more. Modern scientific discoveries reveal more clearly than ever before that God knows everything, that he can choose anything and that he can create anything. The argument goes like this. In the previous episode, I showed that contingent variety is evidence for volitional agency. If the necessary being who made the universe was not a volitional agent, but an involuntary cause, like fire, then the universe would not be variegated, because it is impossible for an involuntary cause to produce both an effect and its opposite. Towards the end of the previous episode, I showed that the seemingly endless contingent variety in the universe, every human is different, every snowflake is different, every fingerprint is different, every leaf is different, every grain of sand is different. The seemingly endless variety is evidence for unrestricted volitional agency, that he has the knowledge, volition, and power to create anything. In this episode, I will show that modern science has revealed more clearly than ever before that God made the things in the universe for a purpose, and that when we add purpose to the seemingly endless variety in the universe, the evidence for God's unrestricted agency becomes conclusive. I will also show that modern science has revealed more clearly than ever before that God has made the purposes in the universe dependent on a highly intricate determination of physical constants, and that when we add this intricate determination to the purposes and seemingly endless variety in the universe, the evidence for God's unrestricted agency becomes incontrovertible. Modern science, in other words, reveals beyond any shadow of doubt that God has unrestricted agency, that he knows everything, that he can choose anything, and that he can create anything. God willing, I will in a little while give specific examples of how modern science reveals all of this. But before I do that, let me illustrate the argument that I have just described. Imagine that you are walking along the shore of what appears to be a deserted island, far from any human civilization, and you look down to find a sheet of metal, nicely cut, shaped, smoothed, and polished. It looks like it was fashioned by a volitional agent, probably a human being, but since you think you are so far from human civilization, you think that maybe, just maybe, it was not made by any volitional agent, but by the non-volitional causes of the natural world. You raise your head a little, and suddenly you realize that the metal sheet is a small part of an assortment, a variety of metal sheets. 
some tall, some wide, some large, some small, some red, some green, some yellow, some black, some bright and shiny, some dull and matted, some heavy, some light, and so on. You are now certain that these metal sheets were made by a volitional agent, probably a human being, because variety is evidence for volitional agency. One sheet of metal might be the result of a non-volitional cause, but a huge assortment, a huge variety like this, all lying close together, reveals volitional agency. A non-volitional cause always produces the same effect. Whenever there is variety, there must be volitional agency. Then you look a little further and you see that the sheets of metal that you just saw have been assembled into a car. Not just one car, but an assortment, a variety of different kinds of cars. You are now not merely certain that the assortment of metal sheets were assembled into cars by a volitional agent. You are conclusively certain that they were assembled into cars by a volitional agent. Your certainty has increased because now you don't just observe variety, rather you observe variety that has clearly been chosen to fulfill a purpose. Every car has been assembled for a purpose, namely to move people and things from one place to another. Non-volitional causes don't act with purpose, only volitional agents do. The cars could have been designed with or without wheels, with or without doors, with or without engines, with or without windows, and so on. All of these features and many more were chosen so that the car could fulfill a purpose. Their purposeful design presupposes knowledge of all of these possibilities and their outcomes, the selection of one of these possibilities in order to achieve, achieve the outcome of making a car that moves people and things from one place to another, and the skillful production of the cars um, to realize those outcomes. Knowledge, selection, and production are properties of living volitional agents. They are not properties of lifeless non-volitional causes. Variety that reveals purpose is conclusive evidence for volitional agency. Then, just as you are looking at this assortment of cars, a mechanical engineer appears out of nowhere, don't ask how, and begins explaining how the engine of each of these cars works. He explains that each engine is composed of either four or six cylinders. At the top of each cylinder is a piston whose up and down motion is converted to the rotational motion of a crankshaft which makes the wheels of the car turn, which makes the car move. He tells you that the piston moves up and down in four steps called strokes. In the first step, the intake stroke, the piston is pulled down into the cylinder by the momentum of the crankshaft. The inlet valve lets in a mixture of fuel and air into the cylinder. In the second step, the compression stroke, the inlet valve closes. The piston moves back up the cylinder and compresses the fuel-air mixture, which makes it much more flammable. When the piston reaches the top of the cylinder, the spark plug fires, which takes us to the third step, the power stroke. When the spark ignites the fuel-air mixture to cause a mini explosion, which pushes the piston back down. This powers the rotation of the crankshaft. Finally, in the last step, the exhaust stroke, the outlet valve opens. As the crankshaft continues to turn, the piston is forced back up the cylinder for a second time. This forces the exhaust gases out through the exhaust outlet. The cycle then repeats itself. The car is only able to move when the pistons of each of the cylinders fire hundreds of times every minute with perfect coordination. Your certainty that the cars were made by a volitional agent now becomes even stronger than conclusive. It becomes incontrovertible, absolutely unshakable. Your certainty has increased because now, in addition to observing variety and purpose, you observe intricate determination. Not only does this make you conclusively certain that the car was made by a volitional agent, it makes you incontrovertibly unshakably certain that the volitional agent has not just knowledge but vast knowledge, not just volition but great volition, and not just power but tremendous power. Contingent variety that reveals both purpose and intricate determination is incontrovertible, 
unshakable evidence for vast volitional agency. Now, let's take an analogous example from the natural world. Let's take you. First, compare yourself to your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your friends, your colleagues at work, the people in the cars around you when you drive in traffic. All of these people are people, human beings, in the same way that you are a person or a human being. But every one of them is somehow different in size, in color, in gender, in the languages that they speak, and in the features and capabilities of their eyes, ears, noses, hands, feet, everything. Since you've watched episodes 2 and 3 of this series, if you haven't, go back and watch them now, you already know that these differences highlight their contingency, or in other words, their need for something else to make them the way that they are. They highlight their contingency and the contingency of everything about them, of all of their characteristics, and you already know that this contingency, this need for something else to determine them, to make them the way that they are, that this is evidence that they, like everything else in the universe, were made by a necessary being. And since you've watched the previous episode, if you haven't, go back and watch it now, you also know that the differences that you see, the variety in other words, is evidence that the necessary being who made them is also a volitional agent. Now, the parts that the people are made of, their eyes, their ears, their noses, their hands, their feet, and so on, aren't just variegated. They have also been made to fulfill purposes. The eyes to see, the ears to hear, the noses to smell, the hands to hold and manipulate, the feet to walk, run, and jump, and so on. Non-volitional causes don't act with purpose. Only volitional agents do. The eyes could have been made with or without retinas, the ears with or without eardrums, and so on. All of these features, and many more, were clearly determined, chosen, selected, so that the eyes, the ears, and the other organs could fulfill a particular purpose. This purposeful choice presupposes knowledge of all of these possibilities and their outcomes. The selection of one of these possibilities in order to achieve the outcome of making an eye that sees an ear that hears, and so on, and the skillful creation of each organ to realize those outcomes. Knowledge, selection, and creation are properties of a living volitional agent. They are not properties of lifeless non-volitional causes. Variety that reveals purpose is conclusive evidence for volitional agency. I will now analyze just one of these organs, the eye in order to explain how modern science has revealed purpose and intricate determination, that's just another word for selection, inside its parts. This will not just reveal God's knowledge, but his vast knowledge. It will reveal not just his volition, but his great volition. And it will reveal not just his power, but his tremendous power. I will now begin my explanation I want you to pay particular attention to whenever I use the phrase in order to. Whenever I use this phrase, I will be drawing your attention to an intricately determined purpose. Let's begin. At the center of your eye, there is an opening, your pupil. The, the, this opening is there in order to admit light from the outside world into your eye. The muscles of the surrounding iris, the ring around the pupil that gives your eyes their color, relax and contract in order to dilate and constrict the pupil, in order to regulate the amount of light that enters the eye, in order to enable sight in both bright and dark settings. When it is dark, the muscles contract in order to dilate the pupil, in order to increase the amount of light that enters the eye, in order to help you see better in dark settings. And when it is bright, the muscles relax. In order to constrict the pupil, in order to reduce the amount of light that enters the eye, in order to prevent you from being dazzled in bright settings. 
the contraction and relaxation of the muscles in your iris is an autonomic reflex which means that it happens involuntarily without your conscious control and this happens autonomically in order to allow you to focus your attention on what benefits you directly namely using your sight to your advantage rather than distracting your attention towards the dozens of fine movements that benefit you indirectly such as the complexities associated with the dilation of your pupil just behind the pupil lies the lens which is transparent in order to admit light into the eye and elastic in order to stretch and contract in order to focus light that enters the eye in order to help you see clearly both at distance and at proximity. The edge of the lens is attached to tiny and intricate suspensory ligaments which in turn are attached to a ring of tiny and intricate muscle called the ciliary body which relaxes in order to stretch the lens flat in order to help the eye focus on distant objects and contracts in order to allow the lens to return to its rounder shape in order to help the eye focus on close objects. These contractions and relaxations are also autonomic reflexes in order to help you focus your attention on what benefits you directly using your sight to your advantage rather than distracting your attention to the dozens of fine movements that benefit you indirectly such as the complexities of adjusting the thickness of the lens. The light that is focused by the lens falls on the inner wall of the eye called the retina which is composed of neurons, rod cells and cone cells. The tips of the rod cells contain a purple pigment called rhodopsin which absorbs the energy of the light in order to activate a chemical reaction in order for the pigment to break down, in order to induce an electric potential in the rod cell, in order to induce an electrical signal which passes through the retinal neurons in order to be partially processed before traveling through the optic nerve to the brain, in order to be completely processed with the millions of other partially processed signals from the millions of other rod cells, in order to interpret the information into the picture that you finally see. These rod cells work optimally in dark settings and only distinguish between shades of gray. The other kinds of cells in your retina, the cone cells, are the cells that distinguish visual details such as color. You have far fewer cone cells than rod cells, only six or seven million. And they are found mainly in a retinal depression at the middle of your line of sight in order to give you detailed vision where you, where you need it the most at the center of your vision. There are three kinds of cone cells, each containing a different kind of pigment, one of which responds to red light, another to green light, and a third to blue light. This variegation between the cone cells exists in order to help you see color. Each pigment absorbs the energy of the light in order to activate a chemical reaction in order for it to break down, in order to induce an electric potential in the cone cell, in order to induce an electric signal which passes through retinal neurons in order to be partially processed before traveling through the optic nerve to the brain, in order to be completely processed with the millions of other partially processed signals from the other rod and cone cells, in order to interpret the information into a picture with greater detail in your central vision than in your peripheral vision. This processing happens not just in one eye, but in two eyes, in order for the brain to receive signals from two different perspectives, in order for it to merge the pair of two-dimensional images into a single three-dimensional image. This was all a cursory overview of how the parts of the eye have all been intricately determined to fulfill sub-purposes that are purposefully organized in order to coalesce into a highly intricate and purposeful whole that is your eye, which is just one of many other purposely purposefully determined organs in your body. My overview has omitted hundreds of other details, such as the complicated process of irrigation, lubrication, cleaning, and protection that happens every time you blink, an average of 4.2 million times a year, and the vestibulo-ocular reflex, VOR, 
an inbuilt muscular response that stabilizes everything we see by making tiny, imperceptible movements in the opposite direction to where our head is moving. Without VOR, any attempts at walking, running, even the minuscule head tremors you make when you read something on your screen would make our vision blurred, scattered, and impossible to comprehend. The purposeful and intricate determination of all these details reveals not just God's knowledge, but his vast knowledge, vaster than anything we might have imagined before we learned these details. Not just his volition, but his great volition, greater than anything we might have imagined before we learned these details. Not just his power, but his tremendous power, more tremendous than anything we might imagined we might have imagined before we knew these details. But all of these details merely scratch the surface of the purposes and intricate determination in all of us. Modern science has revealed much, 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 much more. Let's break each of these parts, and in fact every part in the body of every living organism, into the most basic unit of life, the animal cell. For over 200 years, since they were first discovered, scientists thought that cells were disorganized blobs and particles that were tossed haphazardly in random directions. Advances in the science of microscopy during the last century now enable us to magnify these tiny cells over a hundred thousand times. We can now see that these tiny cells, invisible to the naked eye, are made up of thousands of tinier parts, which in turn are made up of even tinier parts, and so on, and that every tiny part has an unimaginably intricate sub-purpose in the larger purpose of the tiny cell, which in turn has an unimaginably intricate purpose in the larger purpose of the tissue that it constitutes, which in turn has an intricate sub-purpose in the larger purpose of the organ that it constitutes, which in turn, as we have se just seen with the eye, has an intricate sub-purpose in the larger purpose of the human body. I will now read a slightly adapted quotation from one of the books of Michael Denton, a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and, Techno and Culture. Sci scientists at the Discovery Institute, such as Michael Denton, have done groundbreaking work in explaining how modern scientific discoveries have unveiled the unimaginably intricate purposes in the universe. Before I cite their work, however, I want to note that the way that they use this discovery in their arguments is not always correct, particularly the way that they use these discoveries to reason about the theory of evolution and the way that they will use these discoveries to make their argument for intelligent design. I will, if God wills, explain their mistakes in future episodes. For now, I'd like you to focus on their explanation of the unimaginably intricate design and purpose in the cell. Michael Denton explains that cells are not disorganized blobs. They are unimaginably complex machines. If you were to magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter, you would see millions of openings on its surface, the cell membrane, that open and close to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If you went into one of these openings, you would find yourself in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. You would see highly uh, organized corridors and conduits, the endoplasmic, the endoplasmic reticulum, microtubules and microfilaments that branch in every direction away from the perimeter of the cell, some leading to the central memory bank, the nucleus, and others to assembly plants, such as the ribosomes, and processing units, such as the Golgi apparatus. The nucleus itself would be a vast spherical chamber, more than a kilometer in diameter, in which we would see, all neatly stacked together in ordered arrays, the miles of coiled chains of DNA molecules. A huge range of products and raw materials would shuttle along all the manifold conduits in a highly ordered fashion to and from all the various assembly plants in the outer regions of the cell. As you looked around, you would wonder at the level of control implicit in the movement of so many objects down so many seemingly end endless conduits, all in perfect unison. You would see all around you, in every direction you looked, all sorts of robot-like machines. 
you would notice that the simplest of the functional components of the cell, the protein molecules, are astonishingly complex pieces of molecular machinery, each one consisting of about 3,000 atoms arranged in highly organized 3D spatial configuration. You would wonder even more as you watched the strangely purposeful activities of these weird molecular machines, particularly when you realize that despite all of our accumulated knowledge of physics and chemistry, the task of designing one such molecular machine one single functional protein molecule is completely beyond our capacity at present yet the life of the cell depends on the integrated activities of thousands certainly tens of thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of different protein molecules you would be witnessing an object resembling an immense automated factory, a factory larger than a city and carrying out almost as many unique functions as all the manufacturing activities of man on earth. However, it would be a factory which would have one capacity not equaled in any of our own most advanced machines, for it would be capable of replicating its entire structure within a matter of a few hours. To witness such an act of magnification of 1,000 million times at, at a magnification of 1,000 million times would be an awe-inspiring spectacle. End quote. Over the last several years, scientists have worked with animation artists to turn what biologists like Denton have just described into visual animations. The results are absolutely stunning. I would like you to watch one of these animations in this short online video called Journey Inside the Cell, produced by the Discovery Institute. You can pause this presentation now, watch the video Journey Inside the Cell, and then return to watch the rest of this presentation. The animation that you have just seen is one of many. If you search online for molecular biology animations, you will find many, many more. How can anyone who watches any of these animations not see the vast volitional agency of God? Remember that all of the intricate purposes and determinations that you, that you are seeing are just in a single unit of life, in a single tiny cell. You are not made of just one cell, but trillions of cells, all purposefully and intricately assembled to make your purposeful and intricate organs and body parts, which in turn are purposefully and intricately assembled to make you. The stunningly purposeful and unimaginably intricate determination of everything that I have just described reveals not just God's vast knowledge, but his unimaginably vast knowledge, vaster than anything we might have imagined before we learned these details. Not just his great volition, but his unimaginably great volition, greater than anything we might have imagined before we learned these details. Not just his tremendous power, but his unimaginably tremendous power, more tremendous than anything we might have imagined before we knew these details. But again, all of these details merely scratch the surface of what modern science has revealed. To fully grasp the stunningly purposeful and unimaginably intricate determination of everything that I have just described, we need to go back to the beginning of the universe, which, according to current scientific estimates, was about 13.8 billion years ago. The universe began at time zero as a single, unimaginably tiny, yet unimaginably heavy, unimaginably hot, and unimaginably dense point that contained within it all the matter in the vast expanse of today's universe. At the instant, immediately after time zero, it began expanding unimaginably rapidly and as the unimaginably heavy matter that was packed with unimaginable density into a tiny point began to spread out over a larger expanse of space it began to cool down it took 380,000 years of unimaginably rapid expansion for the universe to become cool enough for the first atoms, mainly helium and hydrogen, to form, and millions of years for the gravitational attraction between these atoms to bring them together into the first stars, and another 
hundreds of millions of years for it to bring stars together into the first galaxies. In 1998, we discovered that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. That means that it is expanding faster and faster, that the speed at which it is expanding is increasing with time. This is surprising because we would expect that the gravitational attraction between all the matter in the universe, the planets, the stars, the galaxies, should pull the matter back together so that the expansion slows down, eventually stops and then reverses, ending in what scientists have called a big crunch. But not only is the universe continuing to expand, it is expanding faster and faster. What is causing this acceleration? Scientists believe that this acceleration is caused by something that they call dark energy that is embedded into empty space all over the universe. The effect of this dark energy on the expansion of the universe is expressed by the cosmological constant, which appears in Einstein's field equations as the capital Greek letter lambda here. The value of the cosmological constant is on the scale of 10 to the minus 120. That's 1 over 1 followed by 120 zeros. This is an unimaginably tiny number. Not 1 millionth, not 1 billionth, not 1 billion billionth, not 1 billion billion billionth, but billions and billions and billions and billions of times smaller than that. The 120 digit accuracy of the cosmological constant is stunning. If this unimaginably tiny number had been just a little bigger or just a little smaller by an unimaginably tiny amount, neither we nor ourselves would exist. The universe would, it would have either expanded even faster, dispersing matter too fast for it to clump together to form planets, stars and galaxies, or it would have led to the universe recollapsing back upon itself a long time ago. The 120 digit accuracy of the cosmological constant reveals that God knew the exact value of the cosmological constant that would result in a universe that was suited for us to exist in. It reveals that he knew what scenarios all of the other values would result in, that he specifically determined this value of the cosmological constant and that he brought the universe into existence with precision, exactly the way that he determined it to exist. The cosmological constant is one of at least several dozen other constants each of which needs to be precisely determined in order for us or ourselves to exist. Our sun, like all of the other billions of trillions of stars in the universe, is powered by the force of gravity, which, push, which pushes the atoms at the center of stars into nuclear fusion reactions that create the elements that are essential for life, such as carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and others. Without these elements, neither we nor ourselves would exist. The fusion reactions in our sun also release the energy that powers photosynthesis in plants, which in turn makes the glucose that powers respiration in our cells. Without this energy, neither we nor ourselves would exist. Now, the strength of the force of gravity is determined by the value of the gravitational constant. If this constant was ever so slightly smaller, the force of gravity would be too weak to push elements into fusion reactions at the centers of stars. There would be no stars. And without stars, neither we nor ourselves would exist. Not only because photosynthesis and respiration would not be possible, but because the very elements that constitute us would never have come into existence. If, on the other hand, the gravitational constant was ever so slightly larger, then, too, neither we nor ourselves would exist, because the universe would then be a violent and inhospitable place. Stars would form more easily with smaller amounts of matter. They would be smaller and hotter, emitting dangerous life-inhibiting radiation. They would burn out and explode more quickly, giving less time for life-permitting planets like Earth to develop life-permitting conditions. Planets, stars, and galaxies would be 
would be would all be much smaller and closer to each other solar systems would be unstable and inhospitable to life frequently destroyed by collisions with nearby celestial objects and bombarded with stellar radiation planets would have unstable orbits passing celestial uh, objects would easily knock them out of their orbits and the expansion of the universe would be reversed bringing everything back together into a violent and deathly big crunch there are many other constants in addition to the cosmological and gravitational constants every one of them precisely determined in order to make it possible for us and ourselves to exist these include the constant that governs the strength of the electrostatic force which determines the chemistry that makes the reactions of life such as photosynthesis respiration and digestion possible and the strong nuclear force which overcomes the electrostatic force at short distances so that the protons in the nuclei of the various elements are not pushed apart from each other and the elements that are essential for life such as carbon oxygen nitrogen and others can exist each of these fundamental forces is precisely determined finely tuned not just in terms of their own values but in terms of the relation of those values to the values of other forces if for example the ratio between the electrostatic force and the strong nuclear force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest fraction by even one part in one billion trillion then no stars could ever have formed at all. The formation of stars and everything else in the universe collectively depends not only on the relative values of these two forces, but on the relations of the values of these two forces to the unimaginably intricately determined cosmological constant, the unimaginably intricately determined gravitational constant, and at least dozens of other physical constants. If any of these physical constants had values that diverged from their existing values by an unimaginably small amount neither we nor ourselves would exist now add to the unimaginably intricate determination of all of these physical constants the fact that our planet earth is a terrestrial planet and not a gaseous giant that it has just the right size to support life that it is just the right distance from a sun that in turn has just the right size and emits just the right right heat and light that our planet has just the right atmosphere that admits the heat and light that are essential for life and filters out the radiation that inhibits life, that it has an unusually large satellite that prevents it from wobbling as it goes around the sun, and that nearby lies a massive gaseous giant, Jupiter, whose gravity draws away asteroids to prevent them from hitting the Earth's surface, that our solar system is located in just the right region of our galaxy, away from supernova, whose catastrophic explosions have the potential to sterilize an entire region of a galaxy for billions of years, and away from the dangerous spiral arms of the galaxy, all of these unimaginably intricate determinations, when added to everything that I have just explained, demonstrate beyond any shadow of a doubt whatsoever that not only is God a volitional agent, not only is his volitional agency unimaginably vast, but that he is omniscient. He knows everything that he is omnivolitional, that he can determine the universe to have any description whatsoever, and that he is omnipotent, that he can do absolutely anything. Modern science incontrovertibly reveals the unrestricted volitional agency of God. Wasallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala alam wa huwa hasbunha wa La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah